to Heavenly Father, um, please come to your house as your children, um, seeking your face, to hear your voice. Um, we want to be your church family here in this community to shine the light of your love to those around us. But we can't do that apart from you, and so we, we ask your presence, and we want to open our hearts and our minds to your leading in terms of how we should go forward and where we should go forward and what we should so we ask for your presence here this morning as we worship you as our creator. We know that you know the end from the beginning and that you have everything already lined up if we would be willing to listen to your voice and willing to get out of the way or just to let you work in us to build you your own good pleasure. And so we, um, we come to your house to do that this morning. Just to surrender our lives to you again in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Did you guys appreciate the closeness that you had next door? Yeah, and that's one of the reasons why you're here all on the same side, right? And so what we're I think what we're wrestling with as a church family is how to 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 bring back that warmth, that family, the atmosphere, that open, loving, inviting, attractive atmosphere, right? That's what we want to have in our church, isn't that true? Yeah. Um, and so that's something that you know that I've been wrestling with, something that others have been wrestling with. You know, I came here, you guys have been super accepting and loving and open. Uh, and yet somehow it hasn't, what, what I've come to realize is that there's many people that have been connected or worked connected to the church that are not coming. And for some reason we need to figure out what it is or find ways to, to figure out what it is that we need to do to, to love people back, to, to make sure that, uh, that we're open to God's leading in terms of how to bring people. And so you'll see the title of my sermon is The Lost Sheep. Um, now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach a little bit. But, um, really, I want to talk with you. Okay? I, w I really want to have a talk. I, you can talk back to me. Okay? Part of the things that you liked over there, it was kind of informal and you could be you. Well, excuse me, you're still, it's still the same thing. You can still be you. All right? So we can talk back and forth. Um, we want to listen for God's voice, but may God speaks through many different avenues. All right. So I'm going to start off with the, the, the little story of the lost sheep, and then hopefully we can apply it to ourselves. Jesus said, "What do you think?" I don't want to go by that phrase too quickly. What do you think? Are you thinking? But what do you think? So he's going to give us something to think about. So I'm challenging you this morning to think about these things. First of all, I want you to be, put yourself in the place of the lost sheep. Hopefully that won't be too difficult for some of you. Um, and then I want to look in terms of the lost sheep being others. And we'll talk about that. So he says, what do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them goes astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine and go to the mountains to seek the one that is strayed? And if you find it, surely I say to you, he rejoices more over that one sheep than over the ninety-nine who did not go astray. Even so, it is not the Lord your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Mm -hmm. So a man had a hundred sheep, and he brought them out to pasture. Now in the east, um, they lead their sheep. They know their sheep by name. They bring them up from them when they're babies. They're holding them. If you've seen the picture of, of Jesus carrying the little lamb. In the, in the east, they, they carry their sheep. They actually name every one of the sheep. They know their sheep by name. And the sheep actually respond to their name like your pet, like your pet does, right? So in the east, they lead the sheep. The, the shepherd knows the sheep, and he, he walks, and they follow him, right? So the idea is that this, here's a shepherd, and he's walking through the, the mountains, the wilderness. He has a hundred sheep behind him, and they're following him. Right? But he, when he gets home, and he sees the sheep go in the pen, he knows right away which sheep is missing. He knows its name. He knows everything about that sheep. And he's concerned for that sheep. Right? And he, so he leaves the 99, and he goes to look for that sheep. Now, it doesn't say why the sheep got, got lost. Maybe you can help me. Uh, somehow this sheep found something else 
more attractive or got distracted or something, something veered this sheep's attention away from its master, from the owner. Somehow the sheep was convinced that something else, someone else, somewhere else had something better to offer than the master had to offer for the sheep. So somehow this sheep got the idea that that its needs could be met, that it could find the love, it could find acceptance, it could find value, it could find purpose, it could find meaning for its life if it went somewhere else other than following the shepherd. Are you with me? <clears throat> and so this sheep misguidedly went a different direction. And initially, it might have found something that it thought was going to satisfy its need, right? But, but sadly, um, as the world does, it tricks us. And so what it thought it was going to find to fill the need, it came to realize that it didn't fill the need. And, and the sheep found itself empty, and it found itself hurting, and it found itself needful, and it found itself in a situation that was long. And, and the complexity of the decisions that it has made actually got it caught in the briars and the thorns of life. You know how you make choices and things get complex and now it's like you're kind of stuck. And in the extremity of the situation, in the pain and the loneliness of the situation, the this, this sheep really finds itself. The more it tries to struggle to get away from the briars, or away from the thorns, and away from the thickets and get back, the more it struggles, the, the deeper it finds itself in a mess. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. But, so the sheep finds itself in, on a precipice of life. It can't go forward, and it can't go back, and it's stuck. Can you relate to the sheep's story? Mm -hmm. Do you know anybody like this? And so the sheep is stuck, and it's hopeless, and it's helpless. It's lost. It can't fix the problems. It can't get out of itself out of the situation. It doesn't know where to turn, and it sits there, and it cries for help. Let me, let me read something. In all ages, philosophers and teachers have been presenting to the world theories by which to satisfy the soul's need. Every heathen nation has had its great teachers and religious systems offering some other means of redemption than Christ. Turning the eyes of men away from the Father's face and filling their hearts with fear of him who has given them only blessings. The trend of their work is to rob God of that which is his own, both by creation and redemption. And these false teachers rob man as well. Millions of human beings, millions of human beings that I will add, Jesus died for. Millions of human beings are bound down under false religions and the bondage of slavish fear, of stolen indifference, toiling like beasts of burdens, bereft of hope or joy or the gospel of grace of God, that the grace of God alone can afflict the soul. The contemplation of the love of God manifested in the Son is, will stir the heart and arouse the powers of the soul as nothing else can. Christ came that he might recreate, recreate the image of God in man. So Mrs. White talking about this, 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 this lost sheep and the lost sheep that are lost, she talked about millions of human beings are caught in the situation that I just described, the sheep in. And the amazing part of the story then comes in in terms of the shepherd. The shepherd did not <coughs> forget the sheep. The shepherd goes out and start searching for his sheep. I don't know if you've ever been out in the wilderness trying to search for a lost animal. Um, when I was younger, my wife and I, our dog ran off. And I lived in the country in New York, and if you traversed around the country trying to find a lost animal, it is not. It is not an easy job. And it's not easy to find them, right? And so I was walking around calling out my pet's name. Yes. What do you think Jesus, with the shepherds here, doing? He's walking around and he's calling. he's calling out his lamb's name, yes? And he's listening for any any response. Any response to his voice. Any cry that he can hear to see if the, if the, if the sheep will recognize its need so that he can help it. So he's walking around, he's calling out his name. Seeking the lost. 
the energy, the time, the effort that has gone into saving this lost sheep. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for the shepherd, right? If one of your children didn't show up to the supper table for the first night, and if you did by the third night, you still hadn't missed them, and then you figured out they were lost, what expense would you go to to find your child? Right? So here's the shepherd calling out. And all of a sudden, he hears in the distance a response to his call. And because the sheep responded to his voice and to his call and cried out for help, the shepherd goes over and he to help the sheep. Now let me ask you a couple questions. Does the shepherd ask the sheep where it had been and what it had done? No. no. Because, you know, if it went to a real bad place and did real bad things, then maybe I'm not going to help you. No, that doesn't happen, right? Does it matter where the sheep had been? No. Does it matter what the sheep had done? No, no none of that matters. The, all that matters is that the sheep is responding to the shepherd's voice and crying out for help, and, that, and the shepherd is going to help the sheep. It doesn't matter how, how broken, it doesn't matter how, how simple, it doesn't matter how bruised, it doesn't matter how, how bad the habits, it doesn't, nothing matters because that shepherd is going is committed to, to help that sheep. Yes? Yeah. And when the, when the shepherd finds the sheep, he loves the sheep, he, he reaches out to the sheep, he does whatever he has to do to get it out of the situation it's in, and then bring it to himself. And once the sheep is in the shepherd's arms, does the sheep have to worry about the journey home? No. No. Once the sheep is in the arms of the shepherd, then the sheep can find the peace and the love and the acceptance that it needs. And the way home is, is guaranteed. Amen. In the parable, the sheep, the shepherd, shepherd takes the wounded sheep and he puts the oil and the, and the salve and he heals the sheep and he carries the sheep and he carries and he takes it home. Yeah. And he's, is he going like, to just let go of that sheep and let it wander away again? He's going to leave it out there for the wolves to come get it. No. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Oh, okay. Well, that's a pretty story, isn't it? But it's not a story, is it? No, no, no it's true. And by the way, who is that sheep? Well, for me, it's me. I was that sheep. I hope for you, it's, it's you. Right? Because... Something interesting happens is that that sheep can go home and get healed, yes? And it can, and it can love the master, okay? But then the, the trouble is it starts walking with other sheep again, and pretty soon it's easy for that sheep to not be so kind to some of the other sheep in the pen. Or maybe think that the, it's, its way is the better way, and we start pushing each other around, or start measuring each other's value by each other, and all kinds of things can happen in, in the sheep pen that can cause other sheep to get the idea that maybe this isn't the loving and accepting place that's going to meet my needs that I really need. Maybe I should try something else out there. You see, when we realize that we are that helpless, hopeless sheep, and we realize the love of the shepherd to deliver us, that should not just increase our love for our shepherd, but it should also increase our love for one another. It, it's, a, it's a simple phrase, but I want you to, to think about it. I, how can I claim to love the one who died if I don't love those who think he died? Mm. Jesus says, the way you treat the least of these, that's the way you treat me. Your relationship with the person you see as the least is your relationship to me. Now, if we claim to love him who died for us, then we must. We must love those for whom he died. Amen. Now, that love has to be demonstrated. Love, is, it's not enough to love, say you love someone if you don't demonstrate that love. I don't know, how many of you have had something happen on Valentine's Day? Nobody? <laughs> You're supposed to be able to talk back. <laughs> I, I went and bought my wife a bouquet of flowers, okay, um, and I, I also bought her a little box of chocolate. I bought a little one because she's just trying not to eat chocolate. She's trying to exercise and get in shape, so, but I just 
one thing. I wanted to tell her what? Okay, it isn't about the chocolate, right? But the point is, is I'm trying to I'm trying to show her something that I know to be true. So if we do not demonstrate, if we do not find a way to demonstrate that love to somebody else, then do we love them? No. no. Jesus, the Bible talks about saying and not doing, listening and not doing. It's something about if I'm not doing what I'm saying, I'm, I, I, I'm doing, then I'm, I'm saying that I believe that I don't really believe. Right? So, so love finds a way. The shepherd found a way. He found the sheep. Love finds a way to meet whatever the need is. That's where my burden for our church family is. I knew, and some of you, I still, I'm still wrestling with names. That's how much some of you I have not, no, most of you, obviously I'm getting to see you repetitively, get to know your names, but there's still people here, and their names, you know, God said in the list of church families, some of them I have not met. Why is that? They don't come. Okay? So, which of us have gone out of our way to seek that which has strayed? How many of you have given them a call? Say, hey, we miss you. How many of you sent them an email? Or maybe you sent them a card? How many of you have reached out to them? Is there something wrong? Can I help you? Are you hurting? Are you sick? Are you, are you, are you, are you, are you just discouraged? Is there something that we can do? How many of you, how are we doing that? Are we shepherds that are reaching out to the, our, our fellow sheep in terms of being hurt? You know, Ezekiel 34, and, and when I wrestled with this pastor, this is Ezekiel 34 came to my mind. Ezekiel 34 talks about shepherds. And it says a wall to the shepherds, which means this is not going to be a pretty thing, but it's the truth. So it says, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, verse 1, chapter 34, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherd feed the flock? You eat the fat and clothe yourself in the wool. You slaughter the fat, but you do not feed the flock. Notice the shepherds are using other sheep to benefit themselves, but they're not laying down self to benefit the sheep. Mm. So do they represent the master? Yes. Oh, no, absolutely. Jesus did not come to benefit himself. Jesus came to lay down his life for us. Yes? yes. And if we are his sheep, then what are we going to do? So he says, you eat the fat, you clothe yourself with the wool, and slaughter the fat, but you do not feed the flock. Verse 4, the weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back that which was driven away, nor sought that which was lost. Wow, what a list. Mm. The weak you have not strengthened, you have not healed those who are sick, you have not bound up those who are broken, you have brought back, not brought back those who are driven away, nor have you sought that which was lost. God has given us everything we need. God has supplied gifts in every one of the church members to have gifts and ministries in this church to minister to the needs of the people within this church and also to minister to the needs of this community. Amen. Okay. God always supplies the, 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 the gift and the ability and the strength, the power to do it. If he's asking us to do it, he supplies the gift and everything necessary to do it. So, my channel to you, first of all, I'm going to kind of go through this step-by-step -step process. And I'm using this time because getting the church family together outside of church is impossible. I, I thought we could do it at some meetings, but, you know, for some reason I'll just... People just don't, don't show up. Okay, so that's fine. So here we are as a church family. So I'm going to talk to you. The first step that I think that we need is that each of us individually need to go back to our first love experience when our shepherd bound us in our helplessness 
and in our hopelessness, and in our lostness, and in our brokenness, and in our woundedness, and in our waywardness, we need to go back in our minds to revive our first love experiences, to realize how much God loves us, to remember again what it meant when Jesus accepted us when nobody else would, and we wouldn't even accept ourselves. We need to revive that first love experience again. And that revival needs to be followed by a doing. There needs to be a daily, daily devotional, daily time with Christ, daily study of His Word, on your knees, surrendering your life to God. It needs to come, it's just not just a thought in my mind that I'm going to, yes, I love Jesus. No, it needs to follow with action. There needs to be a commitment, a devotional time. You know, a Christian that doesn't spend time in devotion with Christ soon becomes not a Christian. You can be a Christian in name, but you're not in deed. Right? Now, something else happens in reverse. Those Christians who spend time with Christ every day, study His Word, on their knees, surrendering their life to God, asking God for the gift of His Holy Spirit, those Christians, there's something in them, they can't, they can't keep it in them. They, they just automatically start sharing it with other people around them. It doesn't matter whether it's a garbage guy or the person at work or, or the person who checks me out at Walmart. It doesn't matter. Some stuff comes out of us because it's in us, yes? I mean, the Bible says, let your light shine. It doesn't say make it shine. It just says, just let it shine. So if you're letting the light of the love of the glory of God come into your heart, into your mind, through the word of God and your devotion, prayer, that light will shine out. It will. So... So first of all, revival and reformation needs to start at home. At home means in my heart and in my mind, for me. And for you, it's in your heart and in your mind. And then revival starts at home with our families. If we don't love those closest around us that are our family, then how can we claim to love a stranger? That makes no sense. Now, I don't know how many of you that have family that aren't connected to Christ and you're worried about their salvation. I'm sure every one of us does. I don't know, maybe it's a cousin or maybe whatever. I don't know how far you need to go, but I'm sure that there's nobody in this room that doesn't have somebody in their family that needs to have a relationship with Christ. If my heart is burning for them, then I'm going to be praying for them. I'm going to be reaching out to them. I'm going to be trying to find ways. You try to find ways to demonstrate God's love and to invite them, yes? That's, that's what love does. Love does not sit still and do nothing while people that, they, that you claim love are dying. It just doesn't do that. So, from our, 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 our real family to our church family, the same principle must apply. If we go to church week after week and a brother or sister that used to come to church faithfully isn't here, then they should be getting a flood of visits and calls and, where are you? We missed you, and, right? Is that right? Right. Love is not love if it's not demonstrated. Now, there's some ministries going on at this church. We have table talk this afternoon. We have a prayer meeting Tuesday morning. Uh, we have a Bible study uh, Thursday, at, Thursday at 1 o'clock, right? If there's not ministries at this church, when you start studying and spending time with God, you're going to get saved. If there's something not happening to fill that need, then you know what? Start a ministry. Or let us know we'll start another, another ministry all the time. A time that you can come. I don't care if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'll be there. I don't care what day of the week it is. I'll be there. Because the life of the church is going to be connected. When you give, that's when you receive. Yes? If you want a blessing, you want to have a, a close walk with God, then you need, to, you need to love who Jesus loved. And Jesus loved lost people. And exercising your abilities to reach out to lost people is part of the way you draw near, near to Christ. That's the way he's, he's, when he's closest with you. And I can give you lots of hopes to prove that fact. So there needs to be, there is ministries going on in the church, but if there's not a ministry that you that's going to meet, that's meeting, not meeting your need, and you need some, then talk to, talk to the others, talk to me. Let's see if we can pull another ministry together. But I, what I would like to see, what needs to happen, is that we need to be actively involved in the ministries in our church. You need to be involved in something other than just coming to church Saturday morning. There needs to be another reason why you're here. Another time, why, when you're here. 
another opportunity for you not only to draw close to Christ, but to share that love with somebody else. Now, if we can't love those who are our family, our church family, then how in the world, and we can't draw them back, and we can't give them a purpose, a meaning to be here, then how in the world are we going to draw in the stranger? How in the world are we going to love the stranger down the street or the atheist that doesn't know God? Where is this church going? Where are you going? You know, the Bible tells me that the love of Christ compels me. The love of Christ compels me. I no longer see people as I used to see them, but now I see them through the eyes of Christ. That he who gave his life for me compels me to love others and to reach out and try to share with them what God has done for me. And he says that we, Paul says, we become ambassadors for Christ as though God was making his appeal through all us. To be reconciled to God. If you love someone and you're, you're reaching out to them, they'll see that love. They'll know that you care about them. And it's going to touch their heart. Now, they can make a choice not to come. That's their choice. But, but you, you, you're, the idea of you loving them is not a choice. It should be compulsive. You should be compelled to do so. Please, find a place, a ministry. Come to the Tuesday morning prayer meeting if you can. Come to the Thursday 1 o'clock Bible study if you can. Come to the table talk if you can. If you can't come those times, let's find another time. Yeah. Let's find, if there's not a ministry going on in the church to meet your need, then let's talk to the social committee. Let's talk to people. Let's get that ministry going. Mm -hmm. yes? yes? If we want to reach out to our community, we need to have, have things going on in our church that are going to attract them. The gospel is by attraction. It's the love of Christ that draws us. But there has to be something happening to invite people to it. So we need to, we need to wrestle with that as a ministry. And I love the idea you're all over here on this side of the church. So that means that you want the same warmth and friendship and fellowship that you felt over there. Right? By the way, every lost person, that those millions of human beings that she talked about, they all crave the same thing. And if we have the love of Christ in our hearts, then who better to provide the needs of a thirsty, dying world than the children of God who put His love in their hearts? We need to find a way. Does that mean it's going to be easy? No. Does it mean the answer is simple? No. But, excuse me, is that going to stop us? No. Christ's love compels us to go forward, to find a way. Jesus is that way. But the world doesn't know him. The world doesn't know him. And the world's not becoming a more friendly place. The one already mentioned what happened in Florida. Our world is not a friendly place. And vulnerable people, like Ezekiel 34, are taken advantage of and bulldozed over. Yeah. They need a safe place to come. Yeah. They need to see the love of Christ alive in his people that will attract them. <clears throat> so what I'm asking you to do, first of all, I'm asking you to choose, to make a choice, to, to reignite that first love experience, to spend time with Christ every day. If you need a devotion, let me know. We'll find one. There's plenty of books around here. Some of them have a lot of dust on them. Right? But spend time with Christ every day. And then what I'm asking you to do is start praying for those people in your immediate family who don't know Christ. Start praying for them. Because you know what? When you start slowly trying to love someone into the church, you begin to realize the value and the tenderness of your person. So when somebody stranger walks through the door, and just because they're not the one you are praying for and that you are reaching out to and that you are studying for, you're not just going to walk by them and treat them like they're nothing because you understand the value of a person and the work and the energy and the tenderness and the love that is necessary to draw them, yes? So anybody that walks through the door, even though you don't know them, you're going to value them like you value your own lost family, right? They're going to know the love of God because you're going to share it with them. 
And, and then when you when you were reaching and praying out for your meetings, when you, then I want to, to even start thinking about your church family. And when you go to church, I just marked our card person, right? When we go to church and, and members are not there, they need to get some phone calls. I missed you. I missed you. Where were you? Is everything okay? Can I help you? Is something wrong? Right? Wouldn't you expect that? If you stopped coming to church and nobody ever called you, what would you think? You'd think the truth is what you would think. That they're not thinking of you. They don't care about you. I don't care how much you say you care. If you don't demonstrate it, you, you do not care. We need, to, we need to demonstrate to people that we literally, that we care. And we need to, by the way, it needs to be purposeful. It needs to be planned. It doesn't, it's not an emotional, whimsical thing. The, 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 the shepherd doesn't go out and look for the sheep on a whim. It's just because he doesn't find it in the first five minutes and it gets a little cold out, he doesn't say, oh, I'm giving up on this, I'm going home. That's not how it works. But learning to lay down your life for others is part of learning to know Christ. We say we want to know him, don't we? Are you sure? Because he, he hung on the cross and died for you. Are you willing to lay down your life for somebody else? That's knowing Christ. That's to know him. And if we're not willing to lay down our lives for others, then we don't know him. We're nothing like him. And it doesn't matter how we say and how pretty we look when we come to church. If we're not loving other people, then we don't know him. And that hurts him. Because he died to save lost people. We need to be about our father's business. You know, I was going to talk to you about Jonah. There's one thing in, in the book of Jonah that amazes me. Is that all through the book of Jonah, everybody Jonah runs into comes to God. But Jonah doesn't care about them. And at the end of the book, the one who you don't know is going to, is going to come to God and be saved or not is Jonah. God sent Jonah to Nineveh, and God, Jonah was on the boat talking to the sailors and the captains. Everybody Jonah runs into, God, Jonah thinks he's sent to save them, and Jonah doesn't, doesn't understand that God's sending him to Nineveh to save Jonah, not to save Nineveh. God can save Nineveh on his own. He doesn't need Jonah. Jonah needs to go to Nineveh. Jonah needs to reach out. Jonah needs to stand up. Jonah needs to start demonstrating the love of God. But, but what's Jonah doing? Jonah's He's fighting with God. He thinks he's okay already. He's actually angry when Nineveh repents and is spared. That's how hard his heart is. God sends no Jonah to, to Nineveh to save Jonah. Uh, I know there's something you don't want to preach on sometimes the details, but the book of Jonah is read liturgically in Israel on the day of atonement. Because the book of Jonah is supposed to challenge the reader. You are Jonah when you read the book. Mm. And the question the book ends, are you going to be saved? Are you going to soften your heart and actually start loving people to be like your God? Or are you going to hold on to the fact that you're okay and you're right and you just need to go on a vacation? You don't want this mess. Mm. I look around and I see lost sheep. I do. I was on the way driving here. Have you ever looked at the faces of people driving on the way? Yeah. Most of them are, are, are off somewhere. And they have this sad look on their face. And, 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 and their mind is somewhere else. And, and my heart hurts for them. They don't have to, they don't have to walk through this life it's so sad and so burdened and carrying all this baggage. If they could just know Jesus. They could just let go of those, that baggage, let go of those burdens. That, they, that their eyes would brighten, and, and instead of going down the road sad and thinking, what if, they could, they could actually be going through life looking for other people to love, other people to help. Seeking the lost is part of our calling. You have to find yourself first, Jonah. But if you find yourself, if you find yourself, then God will give you a call for you to start reaching out and loving other people. Dear Heavenly Father, the love that will not let us go. I pray for this church family. I pray for each of these members. Lord, we want to serve.
surrender our lives. I want to surrender my life. And I'm asking them to surrender their life to you again. Lord, we want to hear your voice. We want to walk in the light of your presence. We want to find a way to demonstrate to those people who used to come to the church and be part of our family that we love them, that we miss them, that we want to know them, that we want to help them. Father, we want that love to be in our hearts. We want to be willing to take the time and the energy that it takes to reach out, to go out of our way to love other people. And then if we could actually start loving those we know, then, then maybe, maybe you'll give us the privilege of loving others who died for that we don't know. And they could come here and see the love of Christ alive in this church for them. Please give us the wisdom. You've supplied everything we need in Christ. You give us the gifts. You give us the ability. You have people knocking on our door. You have people sitting here today for the first time. Father, please teach us how to love what you love. Thank you for coming to find us. Please put that same spirit, that same love in our hearts that we will reach out to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.